iron that's hot in Dallas. Let's strike now. And if the Cowboys are interested, maybe they give the Vikings a draft pick and the Vikings move on. I have no idea that the Vikings would want to or that they should want to or where they would go from here. But they're at a decision point. That was Pro Football Talk's Mike Florio, Matthew Collar, and Judd Zolgad here on Purple Daily. Sam Ekstrom from Zone Coverage will co-host the second hour in studio. Also, Doug Farrar from USA Today and a book author of a book called The Genius of Desperation. He's going to join us at 2.30. But we have to begin with a little bit of surprise from me here, Judd that this is the conversation on a Monday in which we just learned late last night that the Vikings will face the New Orleans Saints in the playoffs, that the big conversation is entirely about Mike Zimmer and his job status after the Vikings finish a 10-6 and six season, which I suppose they could have tried a little harder yesterday to go 11-5 and five if Zimmer wanted to pad the stats a little bit. He did not and started Sean Mannion and all the other backups who still had a good day against Mitch Trubisky, which is funny. Uh, but Zimmer finishes <laughs> your Bears fan, a 10 not. and six season. Yes. Through 96 games coached, he is 57, 38 and one. This is the third playoff appearance in five years as the sixth seed, of course, with uh, opportunities earlier in this year to be much better than that. And they deserved criticism for that. But it does surprise me a little bit that Mike Zimmer's name is being brought up all over the national media today, including Mike Florio, uh, Charles Robinson from Yahoo Sports, who's a really dialed in reporter, yes. has talked about ownership using this game to evaluate Mike Zimmer. And that's what I want to ask you, Judd. Is it fair to evaluate people, whether it's Delvin Cook or Kirk Cousins or Mike Zimmer, based on what happens next Sunday in New Orleans? <sighs> I think that depends on how you interpret what you're saying, but here's what I think is fair. I think it's very fair to, at least if you get blown out, make a decision on Mike and possibly Rick too. Not It's really not truly just based on one game. It's based on a body of work, right? And 2019 to me, if you are a Viking follower, has been somewhat confounding because they won 10 games. And to your point, if they had tried hard on Sunday, which they didn't and they didn't need to do, they they would have won 11 games. But all of that being said, when it comes to three people intertwined, fair or not, their names are Rick, Mike and Kirk. When they have had opportunities this year to answer the question, where are you at? Where are you at against the good teams? Where are you at? They have failed. They have failed. And so if you go in and play the Saints, and you get blown out, and your defense, which, by the way, for this head coach at least, was your calling card, I don't think that's based on one game. Now, I am, to be clear, just to, to set the table here, I am not suggesting that, that firing the coach is necessary, but I also think it's very fair to have a conversation about what we've seen Six six years in, if you lose on Sunday, you're going to drop to, I believe, one and three in playoff games. So I don't feel like this is, Matthew, about one game. I feel like this is about a body of work. And that if you do lose and potentially lose badly, it's very fair to be concerned about it. You know what's going to go through my mind if they lose in New Orleans 44 to 10 and the Vikings decide to make a coaching change after that? is two things that go back and forth, sort of ping pong back and forth. Number one on one side would be that this is a coach who never had a superstar quarterback. And the guy who blew him out on the other side has a big bleep eating grin on his face because he's got Drew Brees for his entire prime. And then even past this prime, he's still in his prime somehow. He's setting completion percentage records. He's at the top of the NFL in quarterback rating. He's at the top of the NFL in pro football focus grade. 
everything that Drew Brees has done in his career in New Orleans has been gold. Even when Sean Payton had that dope Rob Ryan as his defensive coordinator and they had historically bad defenses, they were in the playoff race every year because Drew Brees was throwing for 5,200 years. He's a job saver. Everything you do can be completely wrong and Drew Brees will make you right. And then if you do some stuff right, because you're a good coach like Sean Payton is in general, you end up in the Super Bowl conversation every single year. And if you lose... It's probably deep in the playoffs or by something ridiculous like the Nikel Roby Coleman play. And then no one goes, ah, Peyton, he screwed it up. They go, well, we must have got screwed or they needed a miracle to beat us because Drew Brees was amazing. Mm -hmm. So, yes, you get to continue to keep your job. And in Zimmer's career, he has a rookie quarterback. Then he has Bridgewater, who's his franchise guy. Then he falls apart and eight and eight with Sam Bradford then 13 and three with Case Keenum, which is still, I mean, a mystery to how that ever happened, especially if you watched Case Keenum play yesterday against the Dallas Cowboys. Sure. Last year, eight, seven and one with cousins and this year, 10 and six with cousins or 10 and five with cousins and the big games, whether they've won or lost has not often been about the Zimmer defense with Kirk cousins here. How about Russell Wilson in 2018, putting up the lowest quarterback rating he's ever had in an NFL game, in his career in Seattle, and the Vikings losing because the quarterback did not show up. How about Aaron Rodgers in his two games against the Vikings, averaging 6.4 and 5.4 yards per attempt in those games, which is bad, shutting down, slowing down Aaron Rodgers, causing three turnovers, including one that puts you at the 10-yard line of Green Bay, and you lose that game because your quarterback is bad. And now we're going to get here and we all know what happens if the Vikings lose. If I told anyone on the street, hey, uh, I got a crystal ball here, says the Vikings lost. What do you think happened? They go, oh, bad Kirk. Yep. They would go, bad Kirk showed up and he got strip sacked two times by Cameron Jordan. And that's how they lost 44 to 10. The, the fact that we're talking about Zimmer being on the hot seat. And then I look over at most of the games that they've lost. And a lot of it is because your quarterback didn't show up. There's something that doesn't compute there. But on the other side of it is the Marvin Lewis thing, where some coaches seem to only be able to get you so far. Marvin Lewis could only get Cincinnati so far. Of course, that was connected to his quarterback, too. But it was 11 and 5. It was 10 and 6. It was 11 and 5. It was 10 and 6. And it was first round of the playoff seed every time with Marvin Lewis. And eventually, you have to say, well, is there anybody else who's going to do something that could get us somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But when I look at Zimmer's body of work and where he's ranked defensively on his, what his job is, he's done that job exceptionally well. Find me other defenses that can go from 2015 to 2019 and be this in points, fifth, sixth, first, ninth, so fifth. Here's the question. Are, are you comfortable with the stability that Mike has brought? Cause he has no question. He's brought a stability that this, this, franchise over probably a 20 year period lacked consistently or is there an alternative that you if you were the wilfs would want to explore and then here's my question off of that do you trust rick to explore it again or is this a package deal see there's a lot of what, what makes this entire conversation so intriguing to me is the trickle down because it's not just one guy and that's why i go back to the three prime players to me that are tied together are Spielman, Zimmer, and Cousins. And the discussions about this, they are all, I think, and Kirk can be bad, bad Kirk too, but Kirk at his best can be pretty good. They are all adequate to above that probably enough. But are they good enough? Are, are they good enough to win a championship? And if they're not, do you think that you can find somebody who can get those people? This is why this is to me, it's not like this black and white. If they lose bad, make wholesale changes. This is a very nuanced conversation, but I also push back on those who come back and say, Just shut up and don't talk about it. No, it's worth talking about. Well, now that it's being reported in national yes, media, you have to. But it's nuanced. But I was surprised to see it, considering we don't know how this will play out yet. And the overall record of Zimmer is so good since he's been here that we talked about it a little bit, just reporters to reporters off the air and things like that. I wonder how this could go if they fall apart and everything else. Sure. But I didn't expect it 
to see it with Mike Florio talking about it or Charles Robinson or NFL Network talking about the trading trade, him. The trade surprise. Yeah, me. trading him yeah. to the Dallas Cowboys. And I that's mean, legit. Yeah. I love trades. So that certainly piqued my interest. What would you need? Um, if Stefanski was going to take over as the head coach and Gary was going to stay on, yeah. then I think I might take, like, I don't know, second round pick or something. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. Thinking. I'm saying you can't replace Zimmer, but well, second, yeah, round, pick. second but round pick against You, you do have to tell me who's going to be the defensive coordinator, though, because to be top five in the NFL in points yep. this year, yep. when your two starting corners five. have played like garbage, yep. that is really impressive. But now let me let me go through the checklist, though, of you've definitely got to fire this coach. Yep. Like things that bells and whistles go off in my head when someone needs to be fired. A, is the guy... So arrogant, impenetrably arrogant that nobody can convince him to do anything that's not his way or that he'll never change. Yeah, Matt Matt Patricia, Patricia. there's a good there's a good one. He's going to do it his way and that's how it's going to be. And the players can't stand him and they don't want to do what he wants to do. And he gets in tiffs with the media and stuff like that. You're just not you're so I guess would the rigid be the right word that you won't listen to anybody and you won't change anything you do. Maybe there's some of that with Zimmer, but when it comes to at least his side of the ball, we've seen him change and adapt like a chameleon. So I'm not going to go there with Zimmer that players want to be away from the person. Well, that definitely does not apply to Mike Zimmer because Daniil Hunter signed the worst contract in professional sports to stay. Anthony Barr was in tears thinking about playing for anybody else. And Stefan Diggs signed a contract to stay here. Adam Thielen signed an extension. Kirk Cousins signed here. People are certainly not running away screaming from Mike Zimmer, uh, is your side of the ball a disaster? Now, remember, I think it was what Ben McAdoo was supposed to be. Oh, this guy's the offensive genius. He was the quarterback coach for Rodgers. He must have been a genius. And then he goes to the Giants and their offense is bad. I was like, well, okay, we hired you to be the offensive genius, dude. And you were not. Yes. When you were separated from Aaron Rodgers, Adam Gase would be the same thing. You were supposed to be this quarterback oh. genius and Ryan Tannehill's better when he's away from you. Mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. Does Zimmer apply to that? Absolutely not. Mm-hmm. Does he get more out of his players than is there? This year would be a great example of yes. When it comes to the defensive side, is your culture trash? No, of course it is not. It's very good. actually. So, so w- are you losing would be the other one. No, you're not. You're winning a lot of games this season. And even, you know, okay. You've had two bad season since you've been here, not counting the first one where you know, he's just kind of cleaning up the mess sure. and your bad seasons are eight wins where you went into the end of the year, still with a chance to get in the playoffs. That's your worst season. I am having trouble checking off any boxes for Zimmer that would scream. You've got to get rid of your coach. He really is a victim of his own success in 2017. He's also a guy who might pay for the, for the unfortunate quarterback flaws of his GM. This is going to come down to, I can't stress this en- enough. If this does not work, it largely comes down to Kirk's contract, Kirk being okay, but certainly not great consistently, and Rick casting his net and getting Kirk. And and that's why I say, can you can you do this? Can you go down this path of you get blown out by, by the Saints on Sunday, on Monday or Tuesday, holding a press conference that Rick leads and saying, We've decided coaching wise, we're going in a different direction. My response to that would be, I don't know. I think if you're, if you're the Wilfs, if you're going to say, Mike, it didn't work. I'm sorry. Don't you almost have to say the same thing to Rick then too? Do you really trust Rick to go get that next coach that, that next QB? My biggest, my biggest reservation about Mike going into this now is this one. Are you going to draft a QB here pretty soon? Because I think you probably need to start doing that, right? And if you're going to do that, do I do I trust Mike to be the guy who cultivates or helps with that guy? I'm a little bit scared there. But to take that a step beyond that one, do I trust Rick to draft that guy? Also frightens me. So I think if we're going to truly explore the path that these reports are going down, I think it needs to be Rick and Mike. I don't think it can be, oh, Zim didn't do this. Zim didn't do that. Rick was great. No, I think it's a package deal, Matthew. And the quarterback thing is the toughest part of this when you try to evaluate anything. Because even though from the start of the Kirk Cousins signing, 
I didn't love that direction. Mm -hmm. We argued with people for an entire winter about whether that was the right way to go. And so far it's turned out to get you in the playoffs once as a six seed in two years, unless they beat the new Orleans saints and then go and beat the San Francisco 49ers. It's hard to say that it's been a success unless you at least reach the threshold of case Keenum, because your reasoning for doing it was that you could get past the threshold of case Keenum, not win the same games that case Keenum would have won against losing teams like they did this year. That was my reasoning on Kirk cousins was watching him in Washington. It was the very same story that we're talking about. Now he can get you to a certain level, but probably not any farther than that. However, if you're just evaluating, was the process of that decision worthy of being fired? Like just say Ryan Pace for the Chicago Bears after watching that abomination of a sports contest yesterday with Mitch Trubisky play against all backups except Mackenzie Alexander and not be able to move the football and come out of that game with an 84 quarterback rating against literally a preseason roster on right. the second side uh, or on the defensive side. And oh, I mean, congratulations for leading your game winning drive. I'm so happy for you, Mitch Trubisky. But tell me about the process <laughs> of that is what I want to understand. If I'm going to decide that you shouldn't have your job in the future, right. Ryan Pace's process was bogus. We all watched Deshaun Watson be a special, special player. I understand some of the issues with Patrick Mahomes because his offense was not an NFL offense and he didn't have NFL footwork and all those sorts of things. Sure, sure, sure. We've seen the big arm guy fail before. Sure, sure, sure. I get that. But Deshaun Watson, as opposed to Mitch Trubisky, mm -hmm. there's no logical case you can make. So in my mind, I'm sorry, you're fired. You made the most illogical buffoon decision you could, and I can't trust you in the future. Signing Kirk Cousins was very logical. It was, we can make the cap space work because we got the cash from the Wills to do it, and he is more talented than Case Keenum. There is no question about that. We watched all the film. We know we can put him in the right offense. They finally did that and put up really good offensive numbers overall this year. So I can't look at the front office and say, here is where you have failed so badly mm -hmm. they have two star receivers they have two good tight ends they have a pro bowl running back they have multiple pro bowlers on the defensive line they've got the number one rated pff safety and it's not harrison smith they just freaking found a guy and made him the best safety mm -hmm. and even though their corners have played poorly they got two other ones who are good and are probably going to step in next year so why am I looking at the general manager and saying, well, sorry, bud, you got to go. You only built a great roster whose quarterback did not show up in the biggest games this year. And that's why you're in the position you're in. Right. But that's the key thing. He didn't show up. That's your guy. And, and you, you went in and told the Wilfs it would work. Again, I'm not advocating for changes here. What I'm saying is I think the reports that we are seeing today and speculation stems from those things. And and th the fact that in March of 2018, when Kirk Cousins came here, the expectation, what the Wills were basically told was, this is the this is the final piece. This is the step. They didn't get there. And I don't think they're going to. Now, the problem is this, though. If you decide to make a change, what are you doing here? And, and by the way, and here's a, a question for you, because you're at that uh, you're at the practice facility all the time. I'm growing annoyed personally by the Stefanski talk in this realm. Kevin Stefanski's done a very nice job, and I think he's a very bright guy, okay? I know him a little bit, not super well. But this whole notion that there would just be this swap. Hey, Mike's gone, Kevin's here. Mike has done, Mike has his faults, all right? But guiding a 53-man roster is not simple, and it takes a multitude of things. It can't be, I can really call plays, so everyone, you know, follow me, right? So I do think that if the if the plan is, oh, we got waxed by the Saints, what can we do? Stefanski's next up, and we're firing Mike. That, to me, falls way short because that that's the type of thing that teams do who win 10 games, and then they win four games because they <laughs> thought we're so smart. So this is not simple, but the Stefanski thing, there seems to be this growing notion that, oh, this is just, this is a clean sweep. No, I don't agree with that at all. And I think about that for how many other potential coaching candidates. I mean, I don't know. Greg Roman from the Ravens is going to be out there. He's never been a head coach before. There are lots of people who are dubbed as the next great genius miracle worker. 
and then they actually get in that seat. And this is all the Patriots guys ever. They get in that seat and it's a lot harder than they thought it was. Yes. When you're responsible for one side of the ball and you could just go in the film room and you only talk on Wednesdays and nobody ever comes to you with their problems. This is the thing that these coordinators don't realize is that now you're responsible for everything. Mm -hmm. If there's a problem with the team website and some piece of content on it, they might come to you and be like, Mike, is it okay that we have this on there? I and mean, you're like, what, what, why, huh? What? And they always write about you and you're responsible for everything. And you are the one who's going to get crushed no matter what happens, no matter how much it's your fault or not your fault. And, and it's your job on the line all the time, no matter what. Pat Shermer, great example of a guy who takes over a bad situation. They draft a quarterback who's better than Eli Manning, so he plays him, but that doesn't make anybody happy because they love Eli Manning so much. They don't win a lot of games because he's playing with a rookie quarterback in a horrendous defense built by his joke-ass general manager, and then he gets fired. Yes. I mean, this is this is the hardest job on earth to be the head coach <laughs> aside from, I don't know, like going to space or something, right? But in sports, you are fired as soon as you start to slip off even a little bit, and now we're talking about firing Zimmer before they've even slipped off they bounced back to make the playoffs and a 10 and 6 year overall is is solid and with Kirk Cousins as your quarterback I don't know why you expected to go right to the Super Bowl because he had good teams in Washington at times and right. didn't really achieve that and he has limitations to his skill and that's what it all comes back to is that you end up talking about the general manager and you end up talking about the head coach largely because of the shortcomings of your quarterback. Mm -hmm. And and I don't understand why we want to send Zimmer packing because of the shortcomings of his quarterback. Because the Wilsh are ultimately fans. They're fans. And they were told, hey, Kirk Cousins will sell jerseys, number eight jerseys, and he'll come here and he'll do what Case couldn't do. And the problem is, as far as I can tell, it's going to be three years and you, you are going to go to the playoffs, certainly but you're probably not going to have the success that you thought. And coming off 8-7-1 and one in 2018, you have beaten one team in 2019 that has a w winning record, and that's an Eagles team that we all think is pretty much a joke. And so basically you do come down to, and this is true in lots of sports teams, you come down to, to really rich billionaire fans being as disappointed as the fan base because it's probably not fair. But I understand the conversation. Yeah. If that makes sense, I get the conversation. Yeah. No, I do. And when you set a bar at a certain level and as a head coach, you're given all the stars that you needed and that you've been asking for and you draft the center in the first round, which was an overdraft, mm -hmm. and you draft a guard, you spend a pick there, you spend $54 million on Riley Reef, and even the weakest part of your team has a ton invested in it. And then you have pro bowlers all over the field everywhere else. And you're coming off a year where you went 13 and three in 2017, and then you fall apart. Then the the heat turns up on you because that's where the bar has been set. And that's the money that's been spent by ownership. From that perspective, I understand it. I just always have to ask whether it's a quarterback or whether it's a head coach, what's the better option? What would work better than this is always the way I approach sure. everything. Sure. Has there, what's your plan? Has there been coaches who are better than Mike Zimmer? Like, of course, there are several in the league right now, but you know how many have better winning percentages than Zimmer? Not that many. And usually what's the common thread with those guys is they usually have Drew Brees as their quarterback, or they usually have Tom Brady as what's their quarterback thought? or Patrick Mahomes. What, what's your thought on playoff success too? Because I do think, as a head coach, as you progress in years, especially if you've been successful during the course of most seasons, that ownership starts to look at that as well. Yes. And I think that that is, and the I think biggest, that's the biggest that's thing, right the biggest now. thing the, that if they go to new Orleans and it doesn't go well, then they're going to believe that he can't win in the playoffs because they got run out of the building in every area by the Philadelphia Eagles. Correct. And that still sits with people. And from this perspective, I get it that, the goal here when you spend that much money as ownership is not to be 10 and six. It's to legitimately compete with the best teams and to be all the way at the top and to win playoff games because your coaches are better, but finding another coach who's going to be better. I know that's where it gets really tricky because Parcells isn't coaching this team. And so if you're going to tell me, Oh, we're going to hire a guy who's never done it before. Oh, you're right. That is a recipe for going six and 10 next year. They'll call I, him. Though. I think. 
They'll so, call Bill. They always call Bill. Uh, but, you know, I would also say from the fan perspective, people are tired of losing every big game. Yes. And, and that, from that and, one, I don't blame that, them. And that is what they've done. But I think you're looking at the wrong guy because I don't think the defense has performed badly in every big game. That dud against the Packers is a huge deal. Absolutely. It's Absolutely. a huge deal. It changed the entire tenor of fans toward this team when they lost that game.